Ladies and gentlemen, our topic this morning is business cycle theory. Yesterday I was talking to uh, two attendants who are no longer count among us and I said, wow, there's theory, theory, theory today. We we're hoping for some sexy discussion of the Danish welfare state. I said, well, tomorrow there will be theory, theory, theory again, because this is supposed to be an introduction uh, to Austrian economics. And Austrian economics is most of all theory, the rest is, is application. And uh, as Professor Hopper said, well, if you want, are you interested in, in the details, go and have a look at their books. Right. <laughs> well, um, I, will, I will actually uh, say uh, various things about the details of theory, but still I can refer you to some literature. Um, uh, so, so my talk will be based, of course, on Austrian business cycle theory uh, that is essentially uh, on the theory that is, is present, has been developed by Ludwig von Mises and then developed by Mises himself. So first developed in this 1912 book that I mentioned yesterday, Theory of Money and Credit, and then further developed by himself in his, in his human action, and then especially by Murray Rothbard in, in Man, Economy, and State, and also by Rothbard in another book, uh, which he analyzes the American Great Depression, and the book has the title America's Great Depression. Uh, so Rothbard analyzes how it came, uh, came about, and the book has an interesting first part in which he develops further Austrian business cycle theory. Now, uh, I didn't mention Hayek, and Hayek is the most uh, closely associated, so whenever you say Austrian business cycle theory, or most people come to, to think of Hayek, well, uh, the reason why I uh, don't mention him is, uh, is partly been given yesterday in my lecture on uh, on the Austrian school, Mises and the Austrian school, where dif distinguished between the main line and the sideline, and you saw that Hayek is being part of the of the sideline, and uh, so that there are differences between uh, Mises' approach to business cycle theory, Mises and Rothbard's, and Hayek's. All those uh, uh, those differences are not as important as differences that we find elsewhere in the theoretical system. Uh, by and large, my main criticism of uh, Hayek's uh, uh, approach would be that it's a little bit too uh, mechanistic, so a little bit too, too neoclassical, but we'll, we won't do, uh, deal with these differences today. So you just get uh, the main uh, story with one, with some uh, modifications uh, that uh, rely on, on my own works in the, in the past seven years or so. Uh, if you are interested in this stuff, look up my, my website, uh, www.guidohulsmann.com. You'll find, uh, for example, there's an article there published in 98, uh, General Theory of Error Cycles, which is a good introduction. And then there are various papers on fractional reserve banking that also contain uh, discussions of uh, problems of business cycle theory. Um, so what are the main uh, problems, what are the phenomena that we deal with in business cycle theory? Most importantly, we deal here with uh, errors, okay? With systematic or generalized errors. Uh, or as uh, well Rothbard would say, with clusters of errors, that is, uh, with, with the phenomenon that uh, there are uh, uh, situations uh, in economic history in which it becomes apparent that many entrepreneurs have erred at the same time. Now, entrepreneurial error is, of course, the most normal thing in the world. I know it's, uh, I mean, it's not the case that you somehow uh, go out of business school, you've, you, know, right, you have got your diploma, and then you enter the business world, you have the stamp, entrepreneur, now you set out and you reap enormous amounts of profits and become rich and everybody gets, becomes a Will Gate or something like this, right? It just doesn't work this way, as we all know. Uh, rather, there is for entrepreneurs always a possibility, well, the possibility, and that's of course the motivation to make profits, but there's also a very real possibility to make losses, right? And so to, to fail in one's business. And usually, in, in the life of an entrepreneur, you have a mixture of both, right? You have successes and you have failures. Uh, some things that you start work out well, other things uh, work a little less well or not well at all. Right? So you make uh, lots of losses. So in those cases in which the project doesn't turn out the way you hoped it would, uh, we can say, well, the entrepreneur makes an error. Right? So error is then the most normal uh, 
effect of the business world. And we can try to illustrate this now in, in a graphical uh, illustration. Let's say this is the time x. It's the movement of the economy through time. And let's say here we uh, speak of the production of real, real wealth, which I will not define because it's impossible to define. right? Um, but uh, let's say if we were in a situation of permanent general equilibrium, nobody makes any errors at all. Right? We're all just perfect beings, perfect uh, entrepreneurs. Then we will probably have a growth rate, something to this effect, right? Start off in the Neolithical age somewhere. And then very quickly we enter an, an exponential growth rate, uh, growth path, accumulating ever more and ever more and ever more. Now the, the reality of error makes that we never reach really this, this line. Because we make errors, we are somewhere here. Uh, so the growth rate is much lower than it could be in this hypothetical, uh, let's say, angel economy world, right? Angels never err. Uh, the Holy Spirit is with, would be with us all the time, but it is not. So we make have lower growth rates than we could make in, in this angel world. And what happens then? Uh, on top of this, let's say, um, normal, regular sub-pattern of, of error that is always with us, that at times there are peaks of errors, okay? So then error becomes even more important than it uh, would otherwise have been. Right? So if we you now pick up another diagram and we say here the number of errors, which can be much more easily defined than real wealth, number of errors, you have good proxies, for example, the number of bankruptcies filed in, in countries, then you would have to say, well, due to the, the fact that there's always some error with us, that we are not in general equilibrium, uh, if there were no peaks of errors, we would have such a curve, right? Some positive function. But due to the fact what we are talking about in business cycle theory is that sometimes you have this, right? You have peaks. Okay. Now the subject of business cycle theory is to explain these peaks. Where do these peaks come from? Right. Is there a cause? And then there is a, a third question that we have to raise, namely whether they are linked one with another. That is, we have to explain the recurrence of errors. Are these, uh, uh, is this peak caused by a different uh, set of, of factors than this? and this, etc. I mean, that's a logical possibility. And it's certainly true in reality that many uh, such uh, peaks have completely different causes from one another. But the, still the question remains, is there also, are there also peaks that are linked to one another through a common cause? Uh, so that one, the operation of one cause would explain the recurrence of such clusters of errors. Right? The clusters of errors and empirically show themselves, manifest themselves in bankruptcies, right, unemployment, and so on. Now, um, the Austrian uh, business cycle theory, as I said, is uh, a way of uh, explaining these. There are other, other ways. Uh, for example, the most fashionable business cycle theory today in, uh, in universities is so-called real business cycle theory, right, which uh, in my eyes uh, is uh, absurd, because uh, the real business cycle theory uh, says, well, uh, all these, uh, uh, these the, uh, uh, the real business cycle theory tries to explain movements in, in GDP and so on. We've got the time x and we have GDP, right? There's this wave movement and so on, and they do interpret this as a general equilibrium movement. Okay, now. Faced to the fact that we have such a thing as bankruptcies and so on, sometimes we do have ma mass bankruptcy. If you say, well, that's a general equilibrium movement, that's part of a general equilibrium movement, you would have to assume that that was all planned. Right? So entrepreneurs invested their money in order to lose, uh, to lose on it. Right? And people chose an employment in order to get, become unemployment after, after a while. Right? So this seems to be rather absurd on the face of it. We, uh, there is such a thing as, as human error, and uh, we do not uh, approach reality. We are not faithful in our description of the real economy if we just 
uh, solve our, uh, or explain our theory by stipulation. There is no such thing as error in reality. There is, in fact, such a thing as error. And we have to explain where it comes from. So um, the Austrian uh, business cycle theory, as I've said, has been uh, pioneered by Ludwig von Mises. And it has uh, also been called uh, the monetary uh, si um, theory of the business cycle. Okay, the monetary theory of the business cycle. And Mises himself explained at several, in several of his writings that his own theory was an elaboration of an older business cycle theory that had been developed in the 19th century by the so-called currency school. And in Mises' opinion, so these works of the, of the currency school go back ultimately to David Ricardo's writings on business cycle. And uh, we might say there are also two, for example, two French authors that are important, which have developed very similar ideas, namely Jean-Baptiste Say and somebody who is uh, less well known by the name of Charles Coquelin. Coquelin writing in the mid of the 19th century and, and Say writing before. Now the common feature of all these works of the currency school was to explain the business cycle which emerged during the 19th century. It was a completely new phenomenon. Right? Business cycles of this sort did not exist in any previous century. And it was to explain them in terms of um, a perverse operation of uh, the financial or the monetary system. Okay. So uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, de Say, in particular, stressed that the business cycle was a result of uh, the operation of fractional reserve banks, about which you've heard yesterday. I right? Professor Hopper has already well, uh, given you the outlines of the business cycle theory of the currency school, right? which um, by and large says uh, uh, fractional reserve banks expanding their, their note issues will sooner or later come into a situation in which they are no longer able to redeem all the notes that they have issued. That is, they have issued money titles uh, to an extent that makes it impossible for them to redeem all these titles because they don't have the money in their walls. Right? For example, they might issue uh, uh, banknotes giving the right to redeem one million ounces of gold, but they only have 100,000 ounces of gold in their, uh, in their treasury. Right, so if all customers show up at the same time, want to redeem their notes and say, well, give me my money, the banker cannot do this. And at this point of time, we have thus a, a bank run. Uh, so people find out, uh, make the constatation at this point of time, that they actually control less money than they thought they controlled. Because holding the, the bank notes, they thought all the time, well, I actually am the owner of this uh, amount of money, I can control this so I can make various purchases with this. And at the point of time when there's a bank run, they find out, well, that's not actually true. I don't control this. I just control this banknote, and the value of this banknote is exactly zero. That's what you find out in a bank run. Okay. So then many plans are deceived, and that's precisely a situation where we have such an uh, error. Right? So a bank run, a nationwide bank run, is a situation precisely of this sort. Of, of, general, of a general error. It's a general cluster uh, of errors. Right? And if we have a, a banking system persisting through, uh, a fractional reserve banking system persisting through time, such bank runs are likely to recur uh, from time to time. Right? And so we do have here a real business cycle theory. The currency school had a real business cycle theory because it could explain why there should be a cluster of errors. Right? And it could explain how these different clusters that occurred, occurred at different points of time were linked or were related to one another. Right? Let me give you another uh, graphical illustration of this. So here again, the time x. And now here we have now the money supply. Money supply in the larger sense, that is not only money uh, properly speaking, you know, on a gold standard it would be 
so, uh, total supply of gold, um, but also the total supply of money substitutes. Right? Uh, the, bo the two aggregates, money in the narrow sense, that is gold, and money in the larger sense, gold plus, uh, plus money titles, would it be exactly the same in a 100% banking system? Right? With, if all money titles were covered exactly by, by the corresponding amount of gold, the money supply in the larger sense would be exactly equal to the money supply in the narrow sense. It's only in a fractional reserve system that the money supply in the larger sense is larger than the money supply in the narrow sense, that is the total supply of gold. So here we're talking then about the money supply in the larger sense, right? So uh, money titles issued by fractional reserve banks included. And so what we have then, ideally what we would observe is that fractional reserve banking system expands, right? you have an expansion of the note issue, and then at some point you have uh, a bank run, so the money supply plummets, okay, and now the quite one interesting question is how far will it plummet, and it is clear that it can plummet no further than until it reaches the money supply in the narrow sense, right, because the uh, banknotes can lose all their value, and they do lose all their value in a bank run, but the gold itself will not lose its value. Right? That is, as soon as all the, or at latest, when all the bank notes have lost their value, only the money in the narrow sense, that is the gold coins and so on, still exist. And this is so the lower boundary of, of the money supply uh, that will still be in existence. So as soon as this money supply is reached, or let's say at latest, right, because there might be still some banks able to issue notes uh, that are not affected by the crisis. So, but at latest, when this money supply is reached, we have reached rock bottom. Okay, That's a term frequently used in uh, the circles of financial analysts. You read rock bottom. Uh, you have secure ground under your feet again. And how further can it deteriorate? Sometimes we ask ourselves the question, how further can things be run down by our welfare state? Right? When finally will we have reached rock bottom? Well, that's an open question. I don't have an answer to this. But I can tell you that in the case of fractional reserve banking, rock bottom is reached at latest when all the banknotes have lost their value and you only use the money supply in the narrow sense that is gold, gold coins right? in, a, in a gold standard economy. Okay. Now, what happens then if you don't abandon the principle of fractional reserve banking? Well, if fractional reserve banking is not legally outlawed, and they will go, oh, well, there will be new fractional reserve banks springing up, and so the money supply will increase again. Surprise, surprise. And then, at one point, again, there will be a bank run. Tuck. Huh? Money supply will shrink. How far, we cannot say on a priori grounds, depends. Uh, on the empirical circumstances, but at latest, when we reach uh, the money supply in the narrow sense, and so on, then expansion again, bank runs, expansion again, and so on. Right? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is very typical, so this little model is very typical of what we observed in the 19th century. Uh, we had uh, uh, business cycles of a typical length of 10 years uh, that um, uh, was always ended with a financial crisis, with bank runs, collapse of the money supply in the larger sense, and then after this, um, it never came to a prolonged crisis, such in the 20th century, there was no such thing as a Great Depression in the, in the, in the 19th century, right? but after a few months, at latest one, one or two years, the economy took off again, there was further growth, further expansion of fractional reserve banks until it came to the next bank run. Um, now we can raise the question, why, why does it come exactly to the bank run? And uh, here the answer is um, that there is no one cause uh, that typically brings about. Actually, it can be anything. It can be anything. Uh, this, the situation that you have when the uh, uh, fractional reserve banking system has reached its maximum point of, of expansion, so to say, is that all banks are extremely vulnerable. So as, as soon as uh, any bank is hidden by, uh, by an accident, 
right, by, uh, by some bad business, it immediately has a repercussion on all other banks. So in other words, there's a domino effect operating from this one bank on all other banks. So suppose, for example, one bank has a, has a large customer, a large industrial firm or so on, that, uh, let's say, a car maker, and this car maker doesn't sell as many cars as he anticipated. As a consequence, they cannot pay back their credits to the bank. As a consequence, the, uh, the bank does not have the liquidity to redeem its banknotes uh, on a daily basis. So there's a bank run. Right? If there's a bank run on this, uh, on this bank, well, there will be very soon a bank run on the other banks as well. Why? Because in such a situation, uh, there are, uh, uh, the bank has to scramble for additional uh, money to uh, put itself in a position to redeem uh, the demands for redemption. Uh, the, the additional banknotes, so it sooner or later will turn to um, its, its fellow bankers, right, to the other bankers. Now, if these other bankers have already expended their, their note issues uh, to a similar degree as the bank in question, well, they cannot help the bank. Okay? Because if they were to, uh, to help the bank, they would themselves be unable to redeem their banknotes, so they would go, uh, go bank, uh, bankrupt. On the other hand, if they do help, uh, uh, if they do not help the banker in question, well, then this banker will uh, so go bankrupt. There will be a run on it. As a consequence, all the clients of the bank, that is, all the uh, the firms that it that it works with, would either, uh, also be affected. And as a consequence, these third banks that I talked about would be affected too. So let's say we have we have a bank here. Illustration free bank system. Now these are very wretched hovels, right? I mean, in reality, as we know, banks look nice and impressive. Always the, the signs of victory and, and success on it. Greek architecture, solid. Right? So the, the less solid is the interior, the more rotten the interior, the more impressive must be the outside in order to, to get the customers. So in this bank is working, let's say, uh, with, a, with a company, with a car maker company. So this is, is, is Porsche, as you see. I'm in a line of a great tradition of famous German painters, starting with Lukas Cranach. And now it ends up with me. And uh, let's say here we have a, a tire factory, OK? It could be a steering wheel factory or whatever else, right? So if this company, uh, if this bank goes bankrupt, well, it will have negative impact on, on the car factory, which is its, its main customer. And here we have a main customer too. And because uh, the car maker can no longer make all the payments that it used to make because, well, the, the bank falls away, it cannot pay uh, its supplier, the, the wheel maker. And the wheel maker, as a consequence, will be un, unable to uh, make the payments to its banks, to its, to its own bank. So this bank then, in turn, will have difficulties redeeming its fractional reserve banknotes, right? And again, so there will be recussions in other business and so on. So even if we don't talk about the relations of the banks themselves, the direct relations between the banks, it will be through <coughs> the indirect um, uh, network where with other industrial companies, the banks will be subject to a domino effect. Right, the bank run of one bank, or the financial failure of one bank, will trigger the, uh, uh, a bank run on all other banks as well. Okay. Now, since this is so, and since the banks know this, they do have an incentive to help one another out. Okay. Since they know, well, the failure of one of, of the other bankers will sooner or later have repercussions, negative repercussions on, on myself, well, it is my interest then to help the other banker. Okay. There's another dialectic, a further dialectic step, namely that every single banker knows this. Every single banker knows that his fellow bankers do have an interest to help him out. But because this is so, there is a pervasive phenomenon in the banking industry that we call moral hazard. Moral hazard. Hazard. That's a term that has been 
initially used in the insurance industry, but has become fairly widespread in economic science. The theory of moral hazard is not very well developed. But in any case, so the, the point is that a person subject to, is a particular type of incentive, a person subject to moral hazard has the incentive to use more resources than himself controls or than himself owns. In other words, he has an incentive to waste resources because he knows he can rely on other people's money. Okay? And that is exactly the situation that we have in the fractional reserve banking system. Right? Fractional reserve bankers know that their fellow bankers have an incentive to help them out. So they, since they know this, well, they, they are more liberal and more daring and adventurous in their expansion. Okay? And so therefore, this explains, among other things, why we have this ex expansion path. Okay? And it also explains uh, the typical features of industrial organization that we have in the banking industry. And the most uh, outstanding feature of industrial organization in the banking industry is concentration. Okay? We do have not a system just uh, or systems of competitive um, uh, fractional reserve banks have not uh, 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 stayed indefinitely in time, sooner or later it has come to the establishment of central banks. Now why is this so? We'll illustrate this with another diagram. We can illustrate the principle of fractional reserve banking with an inverted diagram. Inverted because it, it makes the point that the lower point here uh, stands for the reserves Right? And this, this larger surface up here are the nodes. Right? And the note, the note issues or the, the issues of money substitutes are larger than the base. Okay? So that's the fractional reserve principle. And if we assume, for example, that we have a reserve ratio of 10%, we might say this bank holds, for example, 10 ounces or 10,000 ounces of gold and issues 100. Okay? That would be a reserve ratio of 10%. Now let's assume we have a fractional reserve system of free banks. Then we have a total money supply controlled by the banks uh, in the order of 30 ounces of gold. And we have total issues of 300. Now since I said we have in such a system uh, moral hazard operating, it is in inevitable that the, the bankers will expand their issues because they, they make the following uh, reflection. Each banker says, okay, in times of need, I can rely on the help of the other bankers. How many reserves do they have? Okay, they have 20 additional ounces of gold, so I can increase my, my own issues. Okay, and ideally, well, each of them will start expanding until 300. Uh, so we get an enormous expansion of the money supply due to the operation of moral hazard. Now the reason why it comes to the establishment of a central bank is that to, in order to institutionalize the cooperation between uh, these commercial banks. Uh, in order to make the, the helping out not a matter of good bill, but institutional. So you add an additional pyramid, right? And you concentrate, you pool the money holdings. Uh, and so, in fact, you have each bank now can expand its money supply to 300 due to the mere pooling of resources that uh, can be either institutionalized through a central bank or can be just spontaneous through the mere operation of moral hazard you uh, get a, a threefold expansion of the money supply. Right? In our example of, uh, of, free, uh, of free banks. Um, now what is the impact of this on the business cycle? We have again the time x and we have here, let's say the, the money supply in the larger sense. Uh, I'll first I plot the the business cycle that we had 
before, before concentration of, of the money holdings was something like this. Okay. Now let's assume that at this point of time, after this, this crash here, after this bank run, uh, the bank, oh, oh let's wait a minute. I don't have enough space on my diagram, so we'll start it, we'll start it further. After the first crash here, they establish a central bank. Okay, what will be the impact on, on the business cycle? Well, we now know that the expansion will be longer, the expansion phase will be longer and more, more important. Okay, and then the crash will also be more resounding and more important. Tang. And then again. Tang. Okay. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, is a model. It's, it's difficult to find it um, one by one in the figures, but by and large, it corresponds to the empirical evidence that we have of the operation of central uh, of, of of the economy after the establishment of central banks. Right. If you look at um, uh, for example, the German business cycle after 1875, when we had a German central bank, uh, or uh, the Italian business cycle also after, uh, after uh, 18, uh, 1890, which was roughly corresponds to the establishment of the Italian uh, central bank, uh, then we observe exactly this. Right? Or the American business cycle after 1913, when the Federal Reserve has been established, is also this. The business cycle gets longer Right? So the uh, financial crises take a longer time to work them out, themselves out, and they are more violent. Okay. And the same tendency is further reinforced if the, the authorities then do the final step that Professor Hoppe mentioned yesterday, namely if they say, well, we abolish redemption altogether, right? so the the banknotes are no longer redeemed into underlying commodity money at all. And so we establish a pure paper, fiat paper money system. So all that people can get, right, so here these banks, they, they still uh, issue money titles. For example, they have deposit accounts that they blow up. Uh, but you no longer redeem them in terms of gold. They're now redeemed only in terms of the bank notes issued by the central bank, right? the, the paper notes. And that is exactly the system that we have today. Right? If you go to your bank and you say, okay, give me my money from my from a bank account, what you get are uh, paper tickets issued by our present uh, paper money producers, right? the Central Bank of Denmark or the European Central Bank or the Federal Reserve. So there's no more limitation to uh, the expansion of the money supply that came through the commodity money that existed before. Uh, now, technically speaking, you can expand the money supply as far as you wish. Right? And that is exactly, so what would happen in this case with the business cycle? Well, let's say, uh, to compare this, let's just say at this point we uh, suspend uh, payments, and we establish a fiat money, then we would expect that the business cycle gets ever longer and again, there's the potential uh, to be even more violent. And that, again, is uh, something that seems to be correlated, or this expectation seems also be to, to be correlated by the uh, empirical record. If we look at uh, the data, so since when do we have pure paper money systems, it's roughly speaking since uh, 1971, right, when the Federal Reserve, the last, the, the central bank of all the, the central banks in the world, abolished or suspended its own payments, since then, the world's on a fiat paper money standard. And we had an enormous increase of the money supply uh, ever since. So my question for you is, what do you think, the f uh, what the factor is by which M1, right, so the monetary aggregate most closely controlled by the Federal Reserve, has increased since 1971? Uh, is it by a factor of two, three, four, five, or six? What's your guess? Well, the answer is by a factor of six. Okay. So, and th this now, I base myself just on the figures of two, on 2003 figures. Right? So, so, since then, it has further increased. So, from 1971 
to 2003, the Federal Reserve has increased the money supply by the factor of six. Okay. Uh, now, let's put this again in, in context. I'm deviating a little bit from my subject, but it's, it's an interesting question, so therefore we should briefly re reflect on this. Uh, how did we come to the system, uh, to the paper money system? One important uh, justification for it was uh, the lack of financial, of monetary stability under a gold standard. Right? The great propagators of uh, government controlling the money supply in the 20th century, not only Keynes, but most importantly, a very important figure was Irving Fisher. Right. According to Irving Fisher, the government had to control the money supply in order to prevent variations of the value of money, of the purchasing power of money. Okay, Under a gold standard, the va uh, variations of the purchasing power of money were too violent. Okay. Now keep in mind that uh, the most important increases of the money supply under the gold standard in the 19th, uh, 20, uh, uh, in the 19th uh, century, now increase of the money supply in the narrow sense, that of, of the gold stock, was 5%. One year, right, or maybe two years, during the gold, uh, great gold discoveries in, in the mid of the uh, 19th century in California and then at the end of the, of the 19th century was an, again another phase of great gold discoveries in, uh, in South Africa and uh, Alaska. So the biggest increase of the money supply at the time was 5% for one or two years. All the other years the typical increase was between 1% and 3% to the existing money stock. Now, again, in the 30-year period, a little bit more than 30-year period from 1971 to 2003, the Federal Reserve has increased the money supply by the factor of six. Now, that's quite something. And the result has been an enormous expansion phase in which we still find ourselves, and we had uh, various short, uh, uh, short crises. For example, there was a crisis in uh, 1987, Right? And then we had a bigger crisis in, 19, in 2001. Right? Uh, and each time, the inevitable uh, reaction of our authorities was to uh, bail the market participants who were in great, or the major players who were in great financial uh, difficulties, to bail them out. That is, to print more money tickets needed to, uh, to give them as credits to these market participants to allow them, in turn, to stay in business, okay? So as to prevent uh, a collapse uh, of the financial system and uh, endanger the economic position of the economic establishment. Okay, so that's, roughly speaking, um, an illustration of the, uh, the impact of industrial organization, the typical features of industrial organization uh, within the financial uh, industries on the business cycle. Right? The typical features of industrial organization that I've mentioned is thus concentration, concentration of the uh, banking industry, and then finally suspension of, uh, of payments. Uh, and the effect of this on the business cycle is to make it more extended, uh, more important, and more uh, violent in its collapse. Now we are just at the beginning uh, of our experience with uh, fiat paper money, so we cannot say uh, too much about, uh, uh, based on our empirical uh, experience, too much about uh, its features, right? We are right at the beginning of this. Most of the time, mankind has been on some system of, of commodity money. So for the very first time that we are for an extended period on a uh, fiat paper money system. Okay, the exposition of business cycle theory that I've given you so far is based entirely on uh, the approach of the currency school. Okay, it's a further elaboration of what the currency school has been doing, which has features uh, problems of liquidity crises. Uh, what Mises did was to enrich this framework uh, not only to enrich it, but to add a different story to it. So what Mises pointed out 
was that there was also another, at least in some occasions, there was another mechanism at play. Right? Uh, here, what we have been stressing so is the, the problem of fractional reserve bank uh, banking uh, system being unable to assure the redemption of, of all the money titles that are being issued, which must lead to a systematic uh, crisis of the, of the banking system uh, in a recurrent fashion. Now, uh, the story that Mises, uh, or the, the uh, causal chain that was analyzed by Mises, stresses a different mechanism. Uh, Mises uh, stressed the, re, uh, the possibility of an intertemporal misallocation. Intertemporal, I always might say, intertemporal disequilibrium. What was his uh, motivation to, to develop this theory? Well, uh, as Mises, so when, at the time Mises started developing his, his theory, the only tenable theory around of the business cycle was the theory of the currency school. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the mechanism that was stressed by the, by the currency school was that people were just withdrawing their holdings from, uh, from the uh, uh, national central banks, and they were starting to export money abroad and so on. Now Mises said, okay, that, that's fine as far as it goes, but we have to raise the question whether it would be possible to avoid the business cycle if we created a one world currency, right? Is this really, if the, 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 the story of the currency school is correct, it would seem to be the case that we could avoid the business cycle just by um, a technical adjustment, right? By a different industrial organization within the banking industry, which just concentrate all resources and uh, then create a one world currency or maybe even a one world uh, uh, paper currency. And now Mises argued that even in this case, there is a mechanism uh, at play that would cause a business cycle theory. So quite independent of the fact that we have national currencies. And what he stressed, well, had been, uh, has been outlined yesterday in Professor Hopper's lecture, but I will nevertheless repeat it because repetition is always useful as a pedagogical device. So here we go. Uh, so what Mises said was that if uh, fractional reserve uh, banks increase uh, uh, the money supply, and if they offer uh, this new money first on the credit market, right, so if they increase in the money supply in the, in the form of credits, then the interest rate on um, uh, on the markets will be below its equilibrium level. Okay. Now this will have an impact on entrepreneurial decision making. What will this impact be? Entrepreneurs will start launching a greater number of investment projects that they, have other, uh, that they would otherwise have started. Uh, an, another illustration of this. Let's say we establish an exhaustive ranking of all possible investment projects in, in an economy. Okay? We don't talk about the criterion for selecting, for determining what is most important. Let's, say, let's just say, well, what is most important will be determined by, uh, by profitability, mm -hmm. and that's by consumer spending. And then we know on a priori grounds that the list has to be cut off at some point. Why is this? Well, because um, uh, the number of products that can be successfully completed depends on the uh, available supplies of real resources. And depending on the size of, of my economy, that is on the number of, of people, on their, on their knowledge, that is on their qualifications and so on, the number of uh, producers' goods that are around the streets, the cars, machines, right? the number of consumers' goods that I, I do have, uh, wheat harvested, and so on. I can produce so and so many uh, goods, that is, I can launch so and so many products that can be also completed. Okay? Uh, at any in other words, at any point of time, we cannot do certain things 
right? Because um, um, we would uh, would be unable to to finish them. A very nice biblical example. So following. Right? So Jesus once said. So imagine. Don't start too many. Said something to the effect that don't start too many things at the same time. Because you will be will give the ridiculous impression of a, of a person who sets out to build many houses and doesn't finish it up. Okay. So let's say we have a number of bricks, right? Number of bricks available, and we can build, uh, let's say, four houses. We can build a total number of four houses with these bricks. Okay. Now, if we started off building five houses. it is clear that we would not be able to finish all of them. And it's just not enough material there to, to finish all this. It's very similar with an economy. Right? You have only so and so many resources at your disposition. Um, if you start too many things, you will not be able to complete it. Only if your economy grows further, if you amass ever more resources, will you be able to pursue a greater number of projects. So what is the consequence if we start too many projects? Well, we build them up, right? So the walls go taller and taller and taller. And at this point, let's say, we'll find out, oh, we've run out of bricks. And right? we cannot finish. So what do we do? Well, we try to, trans um, uh, to use some of the bricks that we used, let's say, in this house. We abolish this project and try to take the bricks out and use them elsewhere. But in so doing, uh, we cannot fail but to, to, to break a couple of bricks. Right? So that's a metaphor for the fact that all real resources are only perfectly substitutable for one another. Right? They cannot be without losses, be transformed from one industry to another. For example, if you have this nice bar here and Hubert should ever go bankrupt with this, uh, uh, with this nice uh, outfit here, which I do not hope, right? but if he ever would, well, you could only imperfectly transfer this bar exactly as it is here to, to some other place. Right? You would have to uh, modify it in some, some ways you, so you would lose some of the investment that you, physical investment that you initially made. So as a consequence, you would not, no longer be able to finish four houses, you would just have three houses. Okay? So the consequence of your initial wrong decision to start too many projects is not just that you lost time which would be bad enough, right? would mean lower production, but that you actually destroy part of the capital that you would otherwise have had. Okay? So that's exactly happening here uh, in this list of our projects. If, uh, due to the expansion of the money supply, the interest rate drops below the equilibrium level, then because interest rates are part of the cost components of any uh, investment projects, some projects will appear to be profitable that would not have appeared so otherwise. Right? So some entrepreneurs will think, oh, we, our line is not, our budget line is not actually here, the, the budget line for the national economy is not here, but it's actually here, we can do so many more things. Right? And so they start building the additional fifth house. Right? And then sooner or later they find out what our, our builders would have found out in our simple example here, and then you find out that the resources are not ju just not there. So they have to stop. And that's the moment when the crisis set in. Right? So that's the moment when we have a business uh, crisis, a big crash. And then right, people have to select the most important ventures. And it could be just so we're jumping from here to our, from our imaginary budget line to what is then the real budget line. Right? We select a number of uh, ventures that can be completed, right? I mean those here, and this number is smaller than the number of projects that we could have completed uh, if we hadn't messed with the money supply in the first place. Okay. So we have here an intertemporal misallocation of resources, intertemporal because the production process is extended through time. Right? So if we want to produce a consumer good at this point of time, we have to start somewhere here. Right? In order to build up a finished house, you have to start with the foundations. As long as you work on the foundations, 
well, you're not yet really aware how far you can get in construing the house. You're just starting with the foundations. So here you are, well, maybe in the car industry, you're well, uh, producing the rubber that you need for the wheels and so on. And you can do all this. Right? There's no problem. There are enough bricks available to lay the foundations for all the houses. Right? So there's enough factors of production available to, to produce the rubber and all the, the raw materials that you need for car production. But as soon, uh, the more you move on through time in the production process, the more you find out that you cannot really get to this point here. You cannot complete uh, the production process. OK, now let me give you a final illustration of this. How much, how much time do I have? I didn't watch my, my time. Five more minutes, yeah. All right, so let's come back to our nice illustration. So this is a little y, huh? the, uh, the symbol that the macroeconomists use for real income, right? real income of the economy. And we have here time. And I said before, in our angel economy, the angel economy would have such a growth rate. Okay. Uh, and because we, don't, we are not angels, we are human beings, we would have something like this growth rate here. Okay. So if we just would be human beings, we don't try to be angels, we don't try to play tricks on the economy, that would be the growth rate that we could achieve. But of course, being not only humans, but all being also stupid and subject to the influence of the devil and so on, we do all kinds of terrible things to even further decrease the growth rate that we could otherwise have uh, achieved. One of these things that we can do to ourselves is start messing with the money supply. So let's say if we have at this point of time, we invent fractional reserve banking, and start messing with the money supply, we create something like a boom, right? Prices increase and more business ventures are launched and so on, and we think that we get richer. But as our example with the bricks and so on, as, as Austrian business cycle theory shows, is we're not getting richer at all. That is an illusion. What we do, in fact, is to get poorer, right? What we do uh, in, in such a case is to launch ourselves on a growth path that might still be positive, it right? might still be that we do actually get richer, but we get richer at a lower pace than we would otherwise have. Right? And then we come to the point where we, where we have a financial crisis, where we find out that all the projects, or several of the projects that we, we started, cannot be completed. And let's say at that point, we become more financially sane, and then move on a growth rate that parallels the growth rate that we would otherwise have had, okay, and then start messing with the money supply again. Okay, so further decrease until we have a crisis and then a small sanity and so on. And you see the point of the story is we further, at any point of time then, we further remove ourselves away from the potential, right? So the analogy would be to say uh, under, we are under the impact of complete delusion, right? We pull out our knife Right? And then say, ah, stabbing our, our leg, we were, anyway, we're not angels, but right? knife stabbing uh, in the leg helps us boost our performance. So we stab our leg, say, ah, oh, that's great. I'm now in a growth phase. Right? So, and and it, the truth is that I'm not helping myself at all. I'm further deteriorating my productive abilities. And that's actually the, the real impact of fractional reserve banking. We're not helping ourselves at all. We're under um, the impact of a collective delusion in such a phase, in the boom phase, we think there's actually more growth going on than uh, that is really going on, but we are really stabbing our legs, saying, ah, oh, that's wonderful, growth, right? But uh, the, the, the truth of the story is we don't have growth at all, right? we diminish our uh, productive abilities, and so get ever more away from the potential that we could otherwise achieve, even being imperfect as we are. So that's, in short, uh, the Austrian uh, business cycle theory. Um, uh, the, uh, one important lesson that can be derived from Austrian business cycle theory is that um, the, 
the increases of the money supply per C are not as important as one might think. Rather, what is important are the institutional setup under which uh, the production of money takes place. Right? Production of money per C is not uh, uh, d disadvantages or harmful and so on, but production of money supply uh, under an institutional setup that encourages collective error is very dangerous and reduces uh, the performance of the economy and of in individuals. That was all. Thank you. And you have one more minute for questions. Yep. Could and okay. I totally agree with the Austrian business cycle theory in the in its explanation of um, business cycles. But how come that we've been taught in the in the mainstream universities that ever since 1980 we've entered the stable uh, monetary policy scenario? But even though the money supply has increased ever every year ever since, and if you read uh, like in Rothbard, Main Economy and State, he explains that the the upward pressure on the interest rate should come one day. And, and what I mean by this is that you've seen a lowering of the nominal bank rates ever since 1980, on more or less a stable path. But we haven't seen yet so far the upward pressure coming on the nominal uh, rates, mm -hmm. even though I think that the, 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 the interest rate in the production pro process is, is far higher than the nominal rate in, in the banks, but we haven't seen the upward pressure yet. That's my question. Well, so I mean, there are uh, various other factors that do come in play and that can partially offset uh, the, these consequences that you mentioned that we should uh, expect to, to occur otherwise. For example, we have exportation of money. We have... Uh, a greater international division of labor that has um, uh, boosted uh, productivity within the world, so greater production. We, have, uh, we are still in a phase of um, uh, uh, in which we uh, exploit the, uh, the potential of uh, uh, information technology right, on production, still not exhausting. We are far from, from, from exhausting this uh, process. There are new technologies uh, there right now uh, being uh, uh, exploited in uh, bio, uh, biotechnology uh, and nanotechnology and other things that further boost productivity. So all this offsets partly the, the effects that occur in the mere light of, uh, uh, of the monetary sphere. The net effect of this is, of course, that, that the prices now are lower than they would be, and so interest rates also are lower than they would be in the absence of these uh, developments in the, in the real sector. Otherwise said, if we had not uh, our present monetary system, prices would be much lower now uh, than they are right now. So we had uh, an inflation rate that is a rate of the increase of the price level that has been relatively modest, right, in the order from whatever, five, uh, two to five percent in, in Western Europe in the, in the last 10, 15 years. And uh, without our monetary system, the uh, variation of the, of the price level would have been much smaller or possibly negative. I would have negative uh, the decreases of the, of the price level, maybe 2 to 5 or 10, minus 10 percent. Right. The, the, uh, the problem uh, is, of course, uh, so the, the, the development of the price level per se is not a problem. What is a problem is, uh, uh, intertemporal misallocation, which might or might not exist, right? and what is a problem is that we have an uh, artificial uh, concentration of uh, industrial organization, and that we have a very widespread moral hazard, and that's exactly what we observed in the, uh, the financial markets in between 1906 and 2001 in particular. What we still observe in the in the uh, real estate market, both in the U.S. but also in Europe. Uh, Great Britain, but also France. I think in, in Denmark we've talked about this. The situation seems to be similar, right? that, that people are betting on uh, prices getting ever, ever higher. They think they've, they've found a bonanza. And, uh, and so start uh, wasting resources. Right? They put an artificial amount of money in projects that cannot, be, that cannot bring the yield that they, they hope it will bring, in any case, in the long run. Right, so that, that's, the, that's the real damage that is being wrought by, by the monetary system. It's, uh, 
This damage cannot be expressed in, for, in, uh, in terms of evolution of the price level, but in terms of, well, what is the behavior of market participants? Do they react responsibly or not? Or do they act under moral hazard? And I think we have right now uh, 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 an historical phase in which there's ever more widespread moral hazard. It has also something to do with the welfare state that is being financed with, uh, with the present monetary organization. Do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Um, the real interest uh, rate hasn't been lowered, but it's, there's only this artificial uh, nominal uh, lowered interest rate. But why are capitalists fooled by this uh, nominal rate? Uh, shouldn't you, you expect them to be rational and just uh, act as if they are <coughs> acting in a market with, um, with the real interest rate? Mm. Uh, we expect that from all other kinds of economy, I think. Yeah. Well, so I, I addressed this, this question in this uh, 1998 article that, that I mentioned, right? So the general theory of error cycles. And uh, to make the long story short, so what you said is right. So there are plausible conditions under which you can assume that uh, entrepreneurs uh, would not be misled and that they anticipate the impact of the extension of the money supply on interest rates. So the, uh, the, the nominal interest rate uh, would be an could be an intertemporal equilibrium interest rate. Okay, so that is imaginable. In this case, the Misesian intertemporal misallocation scenario would not apply. But we would still have, because uh, we have a, a fiat paper money system, we would still have the, the presence of moral hazard. Right? So we still have a waste of resources. We still have a deviation from our real potential. Right? Because people start doing uh, all these um, uh, silly things, right? starting to behave irresponsibly. Uh, it has been long, uh, known for a long time that central banks, in uh, situations of crisis, are confronted to a, to a dilemma. Right? Either they uh, will not expand the money supply, that is, they will refuse to bail out the market participants that are now in, in trouble, right? then they might choke the economy. That's, that's what they say. And we'll, uh, in my talk on, on deflation, I'll show that that is not necessarily the case. Um, or they do expand the money supply, so help the market participants that are now in trouble, but then they create a moral hazard, right? They, they, they create the expectation on the part of, the, of these market participants that they will always be helped. Right? And so they will start doing the, all these uh, silly things. Now, uh, when this dilemma was uh, first noticed, well, it, it was noticed for uh, situations of crisis. Now, uh, based on this definition, we might say that we are now in a, a historical phase of permanent crisis, right? because this dilemma for the central banks is now permanent. And uh, this moral hazard behavior is, is reaching ever wider spheres of the economy. Initially, it might have just concerned those uh, business entities working, cooperating most closely with the central banks. But today, it affects even people, uh, workers, owning some real estate. I mean, yeah, there are fantastic stories from, from the United States where, where people that have an, uh, an annual income, so really working class people and so on, there, but they have some real estate, and they're just betting on ever higher increase. They're taking out equity, right? They, they, they get new credits from their bank. Uh, speculating on uh, uh, on this evolution of the of the prices, and after what I've heard, similar things are occurring right now in Denmark because you have the possibility to, uh, to take out equity too. So prices are going up further, which shows as empirical evidence that moral hazard has reached not only those working with the central banks, that is the governments, right? So their debt have, of course, exploded since 1971, uh, but also regular people. Right, so we have a very serious problem here because it, it shows that uh, central banks or a financial system is starting to affect morals of regular people. And that's, uh, therefore, that's the greatest damage that is being wrought. It has nothing to do with the price level. Yeah. Yes, you say that uh, we are now in this um, enormous expansion phase of credit and what would be the natural course uh, of this expansion phase to go from here? Is it inevitable that it has to increase in, in uh, speed or, or can there be other factors limiting it on its way up? If you look at your graph it just exponentially goes up. Uh, well, this, this is the uh, development of real factors, right? So that's, of course, a positive story. I could tell also a negative story. Right? I could say, okay, uh, we are actually uh, 
we're doing much more than just reducing our growth rate. I could say, well, we're actually destroying capital. We have a welfare state, right? And then at some phase of a little bit more sanity, then we return here, and then we, again, welfare state, so on. It right? depends on how optimistic you are. Uh, ultimately, you, there are indicators that allow you to uh, come up with more or less precise conclusions. The problem is, of course, here that we are talking about an aggregate, right? National real wealth, what's that? Cannot be uh, well defined. But let me give you uh, an answer to your question. Uh, ultimately, there are just uh, three possible issues to our present uh, situation. Either, this is the first one, we return to a commodity money. Okay. Uh, that will imply a big shock for the economy because people have become adjusted in their way of uh, thinking, but also in their, in their morals and their spending habits and so on, to the present lax financial system or monetary system. Okay. So it will be a rude awakening. Okay. Uh, the second possibility is that we go on and that our central banks will uh, decide to just bail out the economy whenever that's necessary. Sooner or later, this must lead to a situation of hyperinflation and then collapse of the entire monetary system. Right? You know what a, hyper, a hyperinflation is a situation in which the prices money prices go up very, very, very quickly. So the purchasing power of money decreases so fast that it no longer becomes worthwhile to hold the money. Okay, so you start to uh, try to, to get rid of it as soon as possible. Uh, these nice stories from uh, uh, photos from the 1923 hyperinflation in Germany and when the workers received their, their weekly pay uh, and um, on Friday in the, in the lunch break and then their, their spouses were waiting outside the factory uh, gates with wheelbarrows. Okay. They needed wheelbarrows to carry all the, the paper notes that their husband. So the husband arrived, I was carrying the weekly salary, the blah, you have the, this, this is my salary, whatever, one billion German marks or so, right? And the purchasing power was like 50 cents before. Okay, then the spouse takes the wheelbarrow and she rushes to the grocery store in order to, to buy something for it. Because if she does not buy immediately, a couple of hours later, the money will have only half the worth, half the value, it will have half the purchasing power. So in hyperinflation, people start getting rid of money as soon as they can. And ultimately, if the decline of the purchasing power is, is, is very, very fast, nobody can use it anymore because it really melts down virtually. Its purchasing power melts down as you hold it in your pocket. So you just refuse to accept it at all. Right? And at that point, when you reach this point, well, then uh, you have no more money at all. That is all the... Uh, uh, division of labor that is, can only be based on money collapses. Right? So you have poverty, misery, starvation, death. That's what's going on. In order to prevent this, typically what you have in situations of, of hyperinflation is that people start using foreign currencies and they start using uh, natural monies such as gold and silver, so commodity monies. Okay. So that's the second issue. And the third issue is uh, that the government starts uh, cracking down on uh, the price increase that is the natural consequence of its increase of the money supply and it establishes a system of price controls. So the third possibility, the third possible issue of, uh, of our present situation is a system of full-blown socialism. That's also a possibility that we cannot rule out. And of course we know what the consequence will be, right? We'll also be increase, uh, a terrible uh, uh, reduction of the division of labor, terrible uh, reduction of, uh, of living standards and so on, and also death for many people. Right? So ultimately, if we do not react quickly enough, and we do not choose to, to uh, allow currency competition right, that would uh, allow for the spontaneous emergence of, of uh, commodity monies, well, uh, we're headed for either socialism or uh, hyperinflation. That's, that's our choice. Okay, we'll stop here need to move on to the next lecture. Thank you.